Okay. Uh, well, good morning. So um, <clears throat> this is um, going to be about uh, operational and uh, operations and turnaround management. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you my approach <clears throat> um, and try to teach you some techniques and, and uh, talk about how we did it here, but there are other appro approaches. And uh, the uh, group that met yesterday we actually ended with this approach. So I'm gonna, it's, a little, it's a funny vignette, but um, so when I was uh, the CFO at Sutter, we, we had just acquired uh, California Healthcare Systems, which is CPMC and Alta Bates and <coughs> places like that. So I was over to meet with uh, Marty Brot Brotman, who's the new CEO, just taken over. And um, they were, at the time, CPMC was losing $3 million a month. Okay, huge, huge loss at that time. And um, the, the old C CEO just left, Aubrey left. And um, they had brought in <coughs> this group called the Hunter Group. Has anybody heard of the Hunter Group? They're sort of hardcore operational turnaround, no nonsense. If you really want to get something turned around in a hurry, you bring these guys in. So I was in talking to Marty, and he actually wanted to get educated on healthcare finance. So I was teaching him. He said, well, these guys are in here, and <coughs> they have this one guy named Tom Honan, and uh, he's an old CFO, and he's, uh, he's meeting with all the managers. And he's got this office, and all the managers lined up down the hall. And he was in meeting with my uh, pharmacy director, <coughs> and he said to the pharmacy director, I need you to reduce your staffing from here to here. And the pharmacy director said, I'm not sure I can do that. <coughs> or he said, no, I don't think I can do that. And Tom looked out the door and said, next. And the guy looked at him and said, well, what do you mean next? He said, well, you've just told me you can't do your job, so you're fired. And I don't have any more sp time to spend with you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> so, that, so that's not going to be our approach, but that is, that, is one <laughs> that is one approach that has been done, okay? So anyway, so we're going to talk about how to uh, recognize that you have a problem, which is not always that easy, um, how to uh, develop a plan, communicate it, uh, and then various, you know, sort of, uh, I want to give you this thing called a break-even analysis. Has, have anybody ever heard of that before? Okay, that's good. That'll be helpful. Because that sort of encapsulates, encapsulates at a high level what you have to do to turn an organization around. <coughs> and then we're going to talk about various elements of the turnaround plan. And this is my approach, but I think, which is a little bit better than Tom's, I think, but, um, you know, also effective. <laughs> okay, so um, let's see. So uh, I, I kind of tried to encapsulate how I go about things. And so the first thing would be uh, determining reality. So w what is actually happening? So when you, when you look at a patient, how do you know that a patient is sick? Okay, this patient, that patient, they may look the same, but this one's maybe flushed, maybe the temperature's high, maybe the pulse, okay? But you, you, might, get, you might get contraindications, right? So from a financial standpoint, you know, there are all kinds of indications and all kinds of information you get. So like when I came here in July, of 2014, <coughs> you know, I asked people, how are we doing? And one group of people said, oh, we're just doing fine. We've got a plan. We're just, everything's great. Talk to another group of people. It's a disaster. Bills aren't getting paid. Uh, we feel like we're being lied to. Uh, we're not going to give you any more money. Okay, so really disparate views. And you're like, well, how can, how can there be such disparate views over you know, an objective set of facts, okay? Um, <coughs> so, but the, the reason was the financial statements were saying one thing, but then the cash was saying another. And you remember how last time we talked about how to read a set of financial statements? And over time, cash has to equal revenue, the cash we receive. That's why one of the measures we track is what is the relationship ratio of <coughs> cash collected to the net revenue we're reporting, because net revenue affects in reported income, right? Big, okay. So at the time, we were reporting revenue here, but the cash was here, like 70%, okay, which is a big gap. I mean, it's like, you know, huge, huge, huge gap. Um, and so 
you know, you do a little forensic accounting and find that and talk to people in the accounting department about, you know, why this number was reported the way it is. And it turned out that really they were over-reporting income. And in fact, things had not been going well for quite a bit, quite a period of time. Okay, so that <clears throat> then becomes, okay, now, now we have a diagnosis of the patient and now we need to start communicating it to the team and start to get that message out. Uh, and that's very important um, because, uh, you know, the first step toward uh, this, I think it's uh, Alcoholics Anonymous or something, but you know, you gotta recognize you have a problem before you can, you know, make progress. Uh, not that I've been to AA, but, um, <coughs> and not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, okay, but uh, communication is key. So the management team, the board, the county, all have to get on the same page. Um, <coughs> and particularly for finance, there's gotta be a level of trust Okay, because once you, you know, I'm, I'm providing, uh, it's like a physician. If a physician has to provide a lot of very confidential information, hard decisions, trust is key. Same thing for what I do with financial information. If somebody thinks that I'm providing information that's not accurate, you know, for whatever reason, then, you know, they don't, they don't believe the message, okay, regardless of any other objective facts. So establishing trust is really, really important. Um, now, in terms of the, the turnaround, things I'm gonna talk about are, you know, f sort of like basic controls of, uh, you know, what do you do when you step into a situation? And um, it's like the, the first rule of uh, when, you're, when you're in a hole, the first rule is to stop digging. Okay, so you wanna, you wanna discontinue what you can, you know, stop, stop, the, stop the bleeding as quickly as possible. Um, also, it's, it's helpful to establish a burning platform. That, that's when, you know, you're, you're standing on this, you know, podium and it's on fire. Okay, you, status quo is not an option. You, getting everybody to realize you cannot keep doing what you're doing. You have to change behavior. Um, <clears throat> developing a credible plan and uh, implementing it, reporting on it, and then governance factors. And, you know, it's, it's really virtually impossible for an organization to be successful unless you have good governance, you know, because things just break down. Okay, so that's, that's a high level overview of what we're gonna talk about today. All right, <clears throat> so this is, a, this is a famous quote about somebody who recognized that he had a problem and uh, <laughs> communicated very quickly and got his team organized and, uh, you know, they worked the problem and uh, had a successful outcome, okay? So I thought that was cute, one of my favorite quotes. So in our case, um, what we did was, uh, you know, look at numbers like this, look at the margin, look at the cash flow, and I was able to say within a relatively short period of time that we had a problem. And, um, <clears throat> all right, so this is something I actually wrote to senior management in October 2014, so I took it out of the memo format and put it into here. Um, <clears throat> And this is, this is communication. I'm using, I highlight these things because these are, these are key words. So the first thing is, okay, we, we had this discussion at the board retreat, number one. So that's recent. I'm, re I'm recommending, so this is your CFO saying, I think this is what we need to do. But I'm not the decision maker, okay? Um, we need an immediate cost reduction restructure plan in order to get ahead of the current negative operating performance. Okay, so I'm clearly saying we have negative operating performance, which is sort of at that point news to some people. Okay, because the perception is oh, everything's fine. Okay. Uh, I believe it is the expectation of the county. Okay, the county is important, because why? They, they hold the they money. They <laughs> the money <laughs> because of the golden rule, the golden rule. Uh, um, uh, expectation of the county as part of a revised interim agreement. So at the time, we, we're having to renegotiate the agreement. Why are we having to renegotiate the agreement? We were tapped out. Because we, we violated the agreement. We were not in compliance with the agreement at June 30th, 2014. Ah. So now we have to negotiate. Negotiate means we have to go back to the county and say, can we have more money? And they're saying, well, <laughs> let's talk about that. <laughs> Let, let's have a discussion, okay? So some of those discussions were, were ongoing at the time. 
Uh, and we will want to be able to show a plan and show some progress in very short order. All right. So these are these are big changes. Uh, okay. Then we said, okay, as discussed, blah blah blah. We're losing two to three million a month, probably. This is my best estimate at the time. Why why can't I be perfectly accurate? Because we don't have reliable financial statements. I, it's like uh, this is this is where I think we are, you know. Um, but I had to keep you know refining. But it was pretty accurate. Immediate action is required. So burning platform status quo is not an option, right? Okay. Um, then work our way down. Uh, over this period, total expenses have increased, blah blah blah, about eight to ten percent a year. Okay unsustainable. That's over a three year period. 10, 10, 10, 30 percent. Unsustainable. Okay. And that's what I said at the end. Not, this, is, this is not sustainable. We have to do something. Okay. So that's, that's identifying the problem and communicating. All right. So that's the first step. Recognize you have a problem. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now we're going we're gonna to do some um, education here. We're going to talk about break-even analysis. Again, how, who, who has heard of this before? One, two, three, few. Not m Most people haven't. Okay. So break-even analysis is all about the behavior of revenues and costs in relation to volumes. Okay. So the way this works is across the bottom on the x-axis you have volume, any volume, patient days, surgeries, <coughs> anything you want. Okay. And going up the top is dollars, either revenue dollars or cost dollars. Okay, and the whole idea here is to come up with a, a revenue and a cost structure and volume that allows an organization to profit, to make money. Okay, because, and sort of like there's this thing called a break even point in the middle, which is the volume at which you make money. All right, below that, <coughs> an organization will lose money, and above that, it will make money. So a good question is, well, what is the break-even point for an organization? We'll talk about that in a minute. But let's talk about how this works. So let's first talk about revenue, which is that top line. And if you follow that line ba all the way back to the left, you can see it goes all the way down to zero. Okay, and the concept there is if we had zero volume, if we had zero patients in our organization, we would have zero revenue. Okay, makes sense. Okay. Um, now that's not actually true. We'll talk about it in a future lesson because we get some revenue whether we have patients or not. It's good. It's good for us. But in this case, it goes to zero. In classic break-even analysis. Um, now there are two kinds of costs, though, expenses. There are fixed costs, things that you have to do just to open the doors, like hire all of us have a building, turn the lights on, okay? And then there are variable costs. Variable costs are, are costs that change with the number of patients that we have. Okay, so what would, what would be an example of a variable cost? Hmm? Supplies, or, yeah. Typically not equipment, but staffing. Mm -hmm. if, we sh if we flex our nurses, if we have more, then that's variable. Now, in our organization, only about 30% of our costs are actually variable. So we have very, very high fixed costs, okay? Now, if we look at, um, let's look at here. So if you look at uh, fixed costs, that's here, and you can see that it doesn't change, right, with volume. Now, here's variable costs. Variable costs also go down to zero and then come up. But if you add this line to that line, it looks like this, total cost. So this is uh, a straight line, and the equation for a straight line is, if anybody's had algebra or whatever it was, geometry, y equals a plus bx, okay? So y, the value of the y-axis equals a, which is that point, fixed cost, plus b, which is the variable cost, times x, which is volume, okay? So that's the straight line. Now, so if, if an organization starts here 
has no revenue but fixed costs, it's going to lose a bunch of money, right? Then as volume starts increasing, revenue comes up. And see, the slope of this line is steeper than the slope of this line. So at some point, revenue overtakes costs, and you make money, right? Okay. Concept, that's the concept between break-even. Now let's apply that, okay? Uh, spreadsheet, okay. So um, uh, I know to a lot of you it's probably a lot of numbers. We're going to break it down, yeah. Uh, can wrinkles stay at uh, break-even? Yes. Yeah. All of those things can affect break-even. Okay, so now what I've done is I've converted a break-even into a spreadsheet. And we're going to start with the current state, okay? And there really are four things we need to, we, there's only four things we can deal with here. There's volume, there's the rate, which is revenue per unit, there's variable cost per unit, and then there's fixed cost. Okay, so in this case, let's say we have 15,000 whatever, discharges, okay, surgeries, whatever, okay, doesn't matter. And each one of those brings in $250 of net revenue. So we have 3.75 million of revenue, okay? Now, we have fixed costs of 3 million, and at, at this volume, the variable cost is $75 per unit. So we have 1.125 of variable costs. So we have a total expenses of $4 million, and we're losing 375, therefore, because expenses are more than revenue, right? Okay, so we're losing 10%. We have a 10% negative margin. The question is, what are we going to do about that? Okay. Okay, now we have four things we can deal with, four ways we can fix this. We can try to increase volume. Okay. So on this slide, we're currently here. So we're going to try to move to there. That's one way. That'll produce profit. We can try to change the revenue. So we're currently generating $250 per unit, discharge, whatever. We could try to get it up to 275, 10% increase. See, 10%. 10% volume, 10% there. Reduce variable costs from 75 to 68. Reduce fixed costs from 3 to 2.7. Okay, everybody get the concept? So going back to that income statement, revenue minus expense equals income. So if you're losing money, negative income, <coughs> you need to increase revenue, either by increasing volume or rate, or you need to reduce costs, either by reducing variable costs or fixed costs, okay? Now, let's play that out. So we have four things. So I, I have uh, four different fixes, one, two, three, four, and then I have one where you do all four, okay? So let's look at this. So on the first one, let's just increase volume by 10%. <clears throat> so now instead of 15,000, we have 16,500, okay? Now here's where length of stay could help because let's say, um, let's say, you know, this is number of uh, patients and our length of stay is high, okay? And we, therefore, we're at capacity. We can't take any more volume, but if we get our length of stay down, we can have to see more patients. And so that, in, that it helps increase volume, okay? So in that case, this goes up, so that increases revenue, right? So now we go from 3.75 to 4.1, that's good. Fixed costs stay the same, but variable costs go up. Why? Because of volume, volume. yeah. So we haven't quite got there. We've improved by 262,000, okay? But still losing money. All right, well what if we what if, what if we didn't get the volume to say, you know, we're just going to increase our rates by 10% or do a revenue cycle improvement program and we can increase our revenue because we're just leaving money on the table. So that goes up 10%. Well, <coughs> we get the same revenue as a volume increase, right? But variable cost doesn't go up. Why? Because the volume didn't change, right? Now we're at break even. Okay, that's enough. That's actually better. And that improved at 375. Okay, <clears throat> well, what if we said we can't do either of those, but we're going we're gonna to get more efficient. We're going to have a, uh, a, pr 
productivity redesign. We're going to tighten the staffing standards, okay? And therefore, our variable cost is less. Okay, well here, the revenue doesn't change. The variable cost goes down a little. Fixed costs stay the same. So we've improved by, t by only 112,000, so we're still losing money, right? So that was okay, but it didn't really get us that much. And then what if we said, well, you know, um, let's just go take fixed costs out. We have, we have 10 vice presidents running the organization. Maybe we can do it with nine, you know, just take some of the cost out. So that is worth $300,000. Doesn't quite get us there, right? Okay. But what if we did all of those? What if we did everything? We said, okay, we're going to deal with volume, we're going to deal with revenue, we're going to deal with all of our expenses, including fixed, okay? Well, the volume goes up, you get a better yield, now you're up to 4.5. You do get the, the cost decrease, which is helpful, but, you know, not that much. I mean, this is 300,000 in total on, well, it's actually more than that, but, um, so 3.8 million, that goes down, now we're making money. Now we've gone from losing 10 to 16% by doing what? All four, having a comprehensive performance improvement program rather than just one thing, okay? All right. Now, another fun thing about um, break-even analysis <coughs> is it allows you to determine how much volume you need to make money, okay? And that's down here, break-even volume, so we can tell from this equation that <coughs> to break even, we need 17,143 units at that, at, that s at that same revenue and expense structure. Any, uh, any idea how we do that? Okay, so what you do, there's something called a contribution margin, which is that number. And the contribution margin is the revenue per unit minus the variable cost per unit, okay? That's called contribution margin, very important concept. And then what you do is you take the fixed cost, which is what you need to cover, and you divide it by the contribution margin, and it works out to 17,143, okay? Now, an interesting, ha in interesting thing happens over here when you do all four of these. You're making money, and look at that the break-even volume dropped to 13,000. So we can make money on lower volume. Very important to know, okay? Where, so where are we, now? Uh, we are making money on actually more volume, but a good example is San Lando Hospital. Okay, San Lando Hospital was losing, actually this is very similar to, San, or, uh, I'm sorry, Alameda Hospital. Uh, this is very similar to Alameda Hospital. They were losing 10%, now they're making money on lower, slightly lower volume in some cases. I mean, I just actually met with the district board last night and had that discussion with Dr. Deutsch, but, uh, uh, well, I mean, the funny thing, yeah, I know, I know. The, the funny thing there is that um, the um, emergency department visits are up, the admissions are up. There's, there's a couple things that are down. Surgeries are down, maybe 10%. Okay, I'm, I'm just looking at numbers, the numbers I see, so. Okay, all right, okay, all right. But they're making money. Anyway, it's a, it's a discussion. But anyway, um, so everybody gets that. Now, let's say, let's say we're over here, okay, and we have to make a decision about what we're gonna do, okay? And the problem is that none of these things are free. Okay, we can't just say, oh, let's just increase volume, or let's just, you know, none of these are free. So these cost something, because why? We, we probably need help, right? We need to have consulting help or something else. So let's say on volume, let's say we have to redesign the front end, the registration scheduling process, or we have to redesign care, we have to invest in care coordination, okay? So, um, Let's say we were going to have to spend $10 million to do this. Is it worth doing it? 
<laughs> that 262,000. Probably not. <laughs> what if we had to spend 250,000? What's the return? What's the return as a percentage? <laughs> What's left? But no. That's the key. That's the key. You spend the, you spend the, the fix once, you get this forever. So the return's 100%. 100% year after year after year. That's a very good return. In fact, even if you had to spend 500000 to do that, you'd probably do it. Okay. Or what about the revenue cycle? How much would you spend to fix that? A lot. You'd probably spend a million for that because that the, the payback is three years. Payback is the gain divided by the cost. How quickly do you get that back? And usually, you, you know, usually you're looking for one to two years. You'd probably go out to three, but you may not do four, uh, four at this point. Uh, and similarly for these things, okay? So that's just how you approach this. Now, in our case, we said, okay, volume, um, we're going to work on ourselves. We can, we can do that. Um, revenue cycle, we need to invest in. Uh, cost, we, we had, a, I'll show you what we did on cost, and that, that costs some money too. Okay, so, all right. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah. How did you get that 17 million for what you were trying to put? Okay. You, the numerator is the revenue per unit of service mm -hmm. minus the cost, variable cost per unit of service. Okay, that's your contribution. And that is contribution of, oh, I'm sorry, that's actually the denominator. The numerator is the fixed cost. So it's fixed cost divided by contribution margin. And contribution margin is revenue per unit, variable cost per unit, minus the difference between those two, okay? All right. Okay, so this is um, the plan that we actually presented to the board in January 15. So this is now six months on. Uh, you'd be surprised how long it takes to do basic things uh, in an organization that's used to being bureaucratic, but it, it took us this long to organize. Um, <coughs> but this is the, the actual plan, the actual slide that we used with the Board of Directors in January 2015. We said, okay, um, we, we need to get to profitability. So our plan is to get to profitability by June 30th. We're, s we're still losing money. I think it was probably down to a million and a half or two million at that time because I'd started other things al already. Um, <coughs> we need to have a sound cost and revenue foundation. So remember those same things, cost and revenue. Um, we need to optimize the size of our leadership team across the system. What does that mean, optimize? <laughs> Op that's a funny word, optimize. Okay. Okay. Basically it means we need to have the right structure in place. We need to have the right people in the right roles to get things done. Uh, and we'd have to have an organizational culture and philosophy of competency and accountability. Now, one of the things we had repeatedly heard through this period from the county is you folks aren't accountable. You know, you're behaving like you think you're going to get bailed out. And in fact, a good portion of the management team believed we would get bail bailed out. I said, well, we're, we're, you know, we're the county. I mean, they said, no, we're not the county. We're not. We're not going to get bailed out, you know, so. And um, yeah. so, that, I mean, that was just a, that was an extended discussion in and of itself to get the management team on the same page with what's happening and what we need to do. Um, so we're gonna manage cash, vendor payables, credit relationships, and we're gonna build and ensure confidence from the community in our county. So we're gonna restore trust, okay? And at the time, there was not trust, okay? Uh, okay, so what are we gonna do? Well. We're gonna, we're gonna num number one, the executive team is gonna focus. So prior to that point, there was really no, even though there was a strategic plan on paper, nobody was following it and there was no operating plan. So as a result, very unfocused operation. So we're doing a lot of different things. He says, no, no, we're gonna focus, we're gonna do just a few things and then anything not in there, we're gonna discontinue doing, all right? 
um, we're going to implement the plan. We're going to have a new um, systems operations council, which gets together monthly, reviews variances, makes decisions, um, you know, deals with issues. Um, <coughs> again, focus on the priorities. And then we're going to d implement structural cost reductions. Okay, now remember the memo I wrote before it said structural cost reduction. So that 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 means it's not a temporary thing. It's it's we're going to take the essentially the fixed costs of the organization down. Okay. Uh, now ten million might sound like a lot of money, but the fixed costs of this organization are probably five hundred million dollars. Okay, so really that's two percent. Is that right? Five hundred fifty. Yeah, two percent. Oh, and actually, the uh, the ten million was for six months, so really annualized it was twenty. So it's really f like a four percent reduction in fixed costs, which is actually pretty good. Okay. Um, we're going to do an immediate hiring freeze, and then we're going to look at every new vacant position. Has anybody been to the FTE committee? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Good discipline. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to communicate the plan. Um, and then we're going to look for additional cost reductions up to $40 million. Okay. And then we're going to uh, fix our revenue cycle with a target of $15 million improvement by July of 2015. Right? And then we're going to look for other money, other things. Right. So that, that was the plan we put in place at that time to deal with the two to three million loss per month. Okay. All right. um, that was uh, an engagement, I, I think there's, I don't know what the acronym stands for, but it's uh, you essentially contracted with Med Assets to do cost reduction initiatives. And I'll show you what those were. Okay. Okay. Um, there was a, there, that says better two, there was a better one that had been completed that reported savings of about $15 million. The problem was they were not implemented. So they paid this company to come in, you know, identify all these opportunities, and they actually paid them an incentive fee to do it for like several million dollars, and then they didn't do it. And the, and the management did not implement. It's like, <laughs> whoa, whoa, yeah, whoa, yeah. Okay. <coughs> so there, there were perceptions that accountability was an issue. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what did we do? Well, let's see. Okay. So one of the first things we did, and this actually took until uh, February 2015, uh, even though I raised it in like six months earlier. Um, this, is, this is the, you know, you're in a hole, stop digging. Um, get control over contracts. Okay. So prior to this point, virtually anyone any manager could sign a contract with anybody, okay? And often, we wouldn't find out about it until some vendor called six months later and said, hey, how come I'm not being paid? And we're like, paid for what? Well, I've got a contract. I've been doing these services. You know, <laughs> we hadn't even received the invoice yet. Nothing. So that was a problem. So we said, okay, new policy. New policy is there's only two people who can sign a contract in this organization, me or Del Vecchio, period, nobody else. That caused quite a consternation, even at the executive level, because you had other executives saying, well, wait a minute, I'm a C-level executive. I should be able to sign contracts. And it's like, no, no, no. Because we need to track them. We need to make sure that everybody knows what we're doing. Now, we, did, we also went in and looked at the, um, um, the signatory policy on who can authorize expenditures. So signing a contract is one thing, which only two people can do. Any manager has a certain limit that they can authorize expenditures that have already been contracted with you, or they're in your budget or whatever. Okay, so we revised that, and so we knew who could who could do what in the organization. So that's like the first step of putting some accountability in place. It's like be very specific about who can do what, who can bind the organization, who can authorize expenditures. Okay, so now we can have accountability because if somebody exceeds their authority or if somebody makes a, you know bad decision or whatever, we know who to talk to, okay? Um, we also revised the contracting process itself, which was broken. Um, uh, didn't have competent people in the contracting department, had poor processes, uh, poor systems. So uh, we 
took the time to redesign our contracting function, both for normal contracts, physician contracts, and managed care contracts. Okay? So one of the first things we're doing at the very beginning is getting control over contracts. Um, then we spent quite a bit of time talking about the culture of accountability. And uh, those of you who went to lead sessions in this time probably saw this slide or something similar to it. Um, but it said, you know, we're actually going to have accountability in the organization. And accountability um, took the form of new committees, new processes you have to go through, capital committee to buy capital equipment, an FT review committee, monthly variance committee. Probably some of you have been to that. One-on-one um, -on -one leadership mentoring in certain cases. Um, and at the bottom, annual leadership performance measurement will include a financial metrics component. And leaders who do not achieve budgets will, be el will, will not be eligible to receive a raise. So there was a threshold established on the performance review that said, if you don't manage your budget, unless you have some type of exception, you're not going to get a raise. Okay. Now, we don't currently have an incentive system, okay, which is like a carrot. And we really didn't have any, there was really no consequences for not achieving your budget. So this is the, this is the stick approach, small stick. Um, it's better than Tom Honan's approach, which was, thank you very much. You know, I don't have time to spend with you anymore because you're fired. <laughs> okay. Um, but we, w we've been working on that incentive system, and I'm, I'm, I think we're close to getting the uh, board to agree to build that in into next year to have an incentive system for managers in the budget. So, happy about that. Uh, okay, so let's see. We've covered getting basic controls, we've covered accountability. Now, cash is a huge issue. And there was a problem with this slide right here. This is supposed to come all the way down, but I think the total is different. So th this is, this is um, the amount that we owed the county and the limits, okay? And then this is how much we owed our vendors. So the normal level for this is about $10 million or less, okay? And we were up to 30 and $40 million. And these are the, these are the same time periods. So July, right there, those same time periods. Now, this looks like we have a little bit of room, but in actuality, we don't. And we don't because of a couple of reasons. One is this is um, a weekly calculation, and so there's different balances during the day. And the other is there's a timing difference. Okay, so this is our calculation of how what much we owe, but the auditor does his own calculation, and we get notified of our receipts before he does, like two or three days. So he doesn't give us credit for those. So I could be sitting here thinking we're at, you know, 185, and his calculation might easily be, no, no, you're at 195, which is the limit. And the other problem is that um, the county auditor really, really did not want to be in a position of saying no when I asked him to fund payroll. Now, why would that be? It is illegal, but it's not illegal for him to say no to me. So it would be illegal for me to let you work without me knowing that I could pay you. But he doesn't, he's not your employer. He's just the banker. So it's not illegal for him. But what would happen to him if he said no? Pe people would be upset. People would be upset. People would miss their rent payments or mortgages. Wouldn't be able to buy groceries. So there'd be a lot of really unhappy people. Okay. So he didn't want to be in that position. So what did he, what do you think he did? So I, I asked him for two I asked him for two things all the time. I asked him to fund payroll and I asked him for money to pay vendors. What do you think he did? Pay I'll pay payroll then I can pay you to pay vendors. <laughs> so guess what happened? Here's our vendors. They went from like here to there. Okay, so how do you think they felt? Not happy, not happy, not happy. Lots of phone calls, put us on credit hold, uh, say, I'm only going to send these supplies if you pay us on delivery or send the money in advance. Really, really unfortunate situation, okay. So um, what we did was to put together a very detailed cash forecast, which is probably a whole other 
lesson, but um, uh, we actually forecast this out on a weekly basis for three years. We included all cash, payroll, AP, revenue coming in, supplemental reimbursement on exactly when it was supposed to arrive. And we said during this time right here that, okay, go with me, but by the time we get to June 30th of 2015, we will be in compliance. We will have the debt down below $150 million, okay? And in fact, da -da -da, bounced around quite a bit, but then nosedived, boom, right there, 137. So, happy. Uh, since that time, we were then able to go into this new year, and we had, you know, another, I was able to forecast this. I'd be able to say, okay, we're going to the new year. It's going to run up around December, January. We're going to hit our peak, okay, which it did, and, but it will be okay by year end. In fact, here's where we are right today, and we expect to be about 110. So the ability to, number one, do a detailed forecast, but then also gain what? Trust. This is where trust really, really makes a difference because <coughs> they're betting that we know what we're doing and we're not lying to them. Because if we'd come to the end and not hit that number, then it would have been, you know, a really bad situation. Okay. So that's cash management. Very, very important in a turnaround. Um, now, another part of the, going back to the break even, um, uh, revenue. Okay, collect revenue. Remember I said, you, you know, over time, cash has to equal revenue. And if you don't, then revenue will come down. So what I wanted to see was an increase in revenue. So when I started, here's what we were collecting. We were recording about $25 million a month in revenue, but the cash was down here like this. Okay, so that's like, that's like a disconnect. That's like the patient, the patient saying, hey, I feel fine, but it's got a temperature of 105, you know, that's, okay. So we worked on that. And as you can see, we made progress during 2014. We carried that through to 2015, and then the black is this year. So we're doing pretty well on cash. Okay, so how'd we do that? Well, we had a, we had a comprehensive revenue cycle improvement program. Okay, so when I showed up, there was a proposal that they were, the board was about to approve for a revenue cycle redesign that was going to cost 25 to $30 million, okay? And I said, we just can't afford to do that. I think we can do this largely ourselves. We need some consulting. Um, <clears throat> and so we rejected that offer. We started our own program. We did use some consulting. We've probably spent about $4 million so far. And, uh, but we've had really, really good results as shown by cash and as shown by all these metrics, okay? Um, let's see, so these are some of the things we did uh, in the billing department, which we call PFS, Patient Financial Services. We completely reorganized it. We went paperless uh, before everything was paper and you couldn't buy anything. Um, we implemented a denials unit. So in this organization, um, it wasn't, this organization in particular was not used to getting authorizations, number one, and two, did not have a denials department. In PFS, so guess what? Lost revenue. So we didn't have to do anything to get to increase revenue, other than complete the paperwork and appeal claims. And okay, so we've had a great success with that. We renegotiated all the contracts. We we looked at contracts and said, uh, is it worth having this contract? That's that's what drove Alameda and San Leandro's contract issues. We said, yeah, we just we can't give away the business. Makes no sense. Um, revenue integrity, we spent a lot of time on um, the charge master and charge capture. It's work still to be done there, uh, but we've made big improvements. Uh, we worked on patient access with getting authorizations. We st set up a unit for that, uh, implemented new systems, and retrained everybody to correct, collect the correct information. And we've made some progress on professional physician billing, but. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done there. Okay, and these are, um, this is a very recent slide showing the things that we're looking at doing for um, next fiscal year. So replacing consultants with permanent leadership, 
uh, getting the observation status issue. We still can't do that here at Highland. Um, more issue, more work on authorizations, care coordination, charge master, you know, blah 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 blah. Lots of things to do. So, so we still have big opportunities on the revenue side. So yeah. I think by changing from ICD nine to ICD ten, makes mm -hmm. a big difference. Right? Uh, it, yes, it helpful. It was helpful, and that that worked. Yeah. So that was good. Yeah. Okay. 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 Expenses. All right. So, uh, do you remember? Um, the slide where we said we're going to reduce $10 million over six months. So that's, this is what we actually did. So this is $11 million over six months, so $22 million annualized. But these are the things that we reported to the board uh, that uh, changes that were actually made uh, in the organization. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see we've, uh, we've cut, out co cut out contractors. We've renegotiated supply agreements. We've uh, just stopped doing some things that we uh, were planning to. Uh, there was a Studer contract. We just said we're just eliminate that. We don't need to do it. Um, you know, lots and lots of different things. So that was, though, an indication that the management team was serious about making reductions. Okay. Uh, then we said, okay, but we're also going to look at these $40 million of additional savings. So the way this works is uh, we'll come in. The gather a bunch of information, notably labor information, uh, and productivity, units of service, things like that. They'll assess uh, purchasing agreements, and then they come back and say, well, this is what we think your opportunity is. Okay, so they came in and said, well, we think your opportunity is about $40 million annually. Okay, now, if you go through the detail of that, there are some pretty you know, big changes because you don't get 40 million just by, you know, just like that. I mean, you'd have to make real staff reductions. And one of the things we've tried to avoid is layoffs because, you know, actually at this time, one of the things we were thinking was, gee, <coughs> we might have to lay off two or 300 people, like, you know, w within, a, within a month. Okay, but we really didn't want to do that. So what we had to do is, <coughs> in, you know, decide what we could do, both in terms of revenue and expenses, put them into that cash forecast that we talked about, and see if it worked, see if it got us to the point we needed to be. And we said, you know, we think we, think we can. We think we can. We think we can do that. So rather than, rather than uh, doing that, doing a big layoff, we said, we're going to pursue this. We're going to have this FTE committee. We're going to work on reducing staff gradually so that there's no layoffs. Okay, so this is the assessment. So what did we actually do? Uh, this is the final report for Better 2. So um, the original uh, opportunities assessment was 41. We said, well, we're not going to do all that. We came up with a list of about 17. But we said the only thing we're going to build into the budget is 8.8, .8. okay? Because, you know, you look at a lot of these and, and uh, yeah, you know, we could do them, but it would just cause so much pain or just not be the level of service that we want to maintain. So said not to. Uh, so that was the target, and this is what we actually achieved last year. Annualized savings of about $12 million a year. Pretty cool, right? N notice that most of it is here in process optimization which is nurse staffing at Highland. So we haven't done San Leandro, we haven't done Alameda, we haven't done ancillary services. So those are still an opportunity, okay? Uh, but we don't wanna keep paying these guys a couple million dollars a year to do it. We'd like to do it ourselves. So the new plan, uh, and I, I know I need to send out a memo on the budget, but the new plan is we're gonna take that variance committee and we have a new chief operating officer who's going to join us next month, okay? And uh, I haven't actually been attending the committee even though I set it up, but he, he and I are going to run that committee. We're going to um, take something called Action OI benchmarks, which some of you have heard. We're going to look at what are the benchmarks. We're going to incorporate that into those meetings. And then we're actually going to use those meetings to set your budgets. So it's not just report on your variances. We'll say, well, where do we want you to be long-term? So it's like a contract between us. So do your budget right there, and we'll do a certain number every month. 
And then, guess what? When we get to the budget process at the end of the year, we're already done. We don't have to go through that anymore unless, you know, there's some request. So we can then use our time to look at strategic initiatives, look at, you know, major operational changes that we want to do or something like that. So that's a new plan. But so this, this program uh, was successful. So, so far we've got, you know, if you go back to break even, so you got volume, revenue, cost. You know, we actually we did pretty well on revenue and costs, even though we have more opportunity. Volumes, you know, lagging behind, but I think that's that's still uh, something that we're going to go after this year. Okay, uh, and we kind of talked about these. And the other thing I'd point out here is that um, the um, the point of these was not just to save money. Um, the the perception we had was that. Um, you know, our managers had really, there, there'd really been no management development in this organization. So nobody had been trained. Uh, people don't understand, you know, financial concepts. Maybe they're not familiar with their, uh, their financial reports. And, and there really hadn't been any ongoing dialogue with them about that. So it's really, we wanted to use that as sort of an educational process to get people up to speed so that, you know, we could be responsible financial managers. Okay, so but these were, these were key committees that we put in place. Yeah. The capital expenditure committee, I guess can you explain how that works? Because frankly, when I ask different people, it seems to be this diversity of committees that's operating somewhere, but we never really quite agree on it, what it does, when it meets, or anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it meets um, uh, generally quarterly or as needed. Okay. The primary purpose is to allocate the capital budget to big areas and then to decide the detail behind it. So, for example, um, next year we have a $30 million capital budget and we had requests for something like um, $60 million, okay, among information technology, equipment, facilities, and strategic initiatives. So the first function of that committee is to say, well, in big numbers, how much are we going to give IT? How much are we going to give equipment and facilities and other stuff? Okay. Well, I, I guess partly I was thinking of the, what I've seen other places, capital committees, yeah. like monthly they talk about capital equipment, you know, different pieces. Yeah. Of stuff, but okay. That's not necessarily the well, no, we're, we're getting there. So at a high level, you set the allocation and then what we do is we have individual, um, I the individuals responsible for those, so Dave Gravender will come in and say, uh, this is why I think I need you know, so much money for IT, or given that I only have this amount of money, this is, this is where I'm gonna spend, spend the money next year. And then we kind of debate that, okay. And then we, then we, can, you know, we can deal with individual uh, uh, purchases during the year. Uh, we probably haven't been as disciplined there as we need to just because, you know, we have only so much time in the day. And I, I wind up just deciding what to buy. So it just comes across my desk and I just do it. So. Okay. So that's what it is. All right. Okay. We're doing pretty well. Um, okay. So now we're talking about governance. So the, the board. So as I said, really difficult to have a – successful organization without a good board. Um, so, you know, our communication with them is critical. This is one of the slides that we used that we said, okay, the management team has met, we've got a plan, and this is our commitment to you. We are going to, we're going we're to institute a culture of accountability in this organization through all the things we talked about. We're going to focus on our strategic priorities and we're going to achieve a 5% EBITDA margin. Uh, we're going to improve certain key ratios, and all the business units are going to improve, and we're going to assess the risks of our plan and have contingency plans in case it doesn't work out. And we're going to give you a budget that's credible and you can believe. Now, believe it or not, they didn't trust us right away. Okay? In fact, I think it's only been in the last couple months that they have. There's a lot of skepticism there, tremendous skepticism. Uh, so, for example, they said, well, we don't, we don't think it's ever possible. How, how, could, how could Alameda Health System ever produce a 5% EBITDA margin? It never has, and, you know, with uh, the business we're in, it's just not possible. And we said, wait a minute. 
you know, first of all, now look at these look at these headings. Volumes, revenue, revenue. See volumes, revenue, revenue, expense, and more revenue. Okay. Familiar concepts? Break even that's that's where it comes from. Okay, so so but well said so let's look at volumes. Okay, we know we have access issues. How do we know? Because people tell us. They said, we can't get our patients in your hospital. Uh, we had a board meeting a couple uh, not a weeks ago, and uh, Dr. Barbaria came in and talked about her clinic up on K6 and said, you know, well, we had this good results, and boom, boom, boom. And well, how'd you do that? So, oh, well, we, we assigned somebody to answer the phone. We assigned somebody to answer the phone, and the volume shot up. Okay? Yeah. So we know we can do that. And there's still access issues. Um, we said with revenue yield, we think we can do more. We think we, we're not at 100%. We can, do, we can do more on revenue. We think that, uh, you know, supplemental reimbursement's an issue. We'll talk about that probably in the next meeting. Um, and there's additional cost reduction opportunities. Productivity management, purchase services, consulting, organization design. And we're going we're gonna to potentially shift our economic model. That's where we're going to come back to that revenue line instead of, and say instead of it going from zero up, it's going to be up here and be sort of flat, okay? More like a Kaiser model. I'll tell you, don't worry about that now, I'll tell you about it later. And then some other potential gains here. Okay, oh, so we gave them this. This is the budget we gave them at the time. And the way to read this is um, you guys can now read an income statement. So you know to look at revenues and expenses and income, right? Right? Okay. So what this said was in 2014, this organization lost $41.5 million. And even in 15, they had a budget of 10, and they lost 27. Okay, so they weren't really close to budget, were they? I, di I didn't do that budget. <laughs> um, they lost 27. And then we said if things continue on the track we're going, in 2016, we're going to lose $58 million. Okay, and, and probably be out of business early. No, actually, it wouldn't go out of business. What happened is the management team would be fired, so I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here talking to you. But somebody would step in and take over the hospital because it has to be here. Uh, but we said, okay, well, wait a minute. Here's what we're going to do, though. We're going to have these cost reductions. Remember that $20 million I talked about? That's what that is. We're going to, at this time, we said we're going to pursue $40 million of cost reductions and $23 million of revenue cycle improvements and there's some other things. This is a kind of a one-time adjustment. Uh, and therefore make $25 million or a 3% margin or a 5% EBITDA margin. So this is, this is we're going to get a 5% EBITDA margin in the year we're in right now. And they, they thought we were smoking something. You know, they really did. But we said, no, no, we're serious. Now, the way the final budget worked out is we only got about uh, $12 million here, and this went up by about 50. So we sh it shifted because we, as we went through it, we couldn't get agreement on the expense reductions, and we are, but we are in fact coming in close to here. So, um, so next year, now we're going to this, the next budget, and we're saying, okay, we, we're going to do a little bit better. And what do you think the board is now saying? They're saying, okay, we know you can do five percent. You need to do better. <laughs> but they said, but we don't want to hear about revenue cycle. We want you to do it with expenses. Oh, because expenses are harder, aren't they? Expenses are much harder. It's much easier, having done a lot of turnarounds, it's much easier to do it with um, volume growth or revenue cycle improvement because it doesn't, doesn't upset. Everybody likes to get, have more revenue. Everybody's happy about that. But you have to come in and, and cut your way out of it, which is what Tom Honan did. It's, you know, you don't have a lot of, you know, it's, it, it's really disruptive, really disruptive. There, there actually are, yeah. There's a lot. Back on that list. Uh, I'm surprised that we still have 
Yeah, look at this. There's a lot of opportunities in the revenue cycle. Well, yeah, I know, I, I know you can look at it that way, but from their perspective, what they keep hearing from the county is, you know, we've seen this before. This is boom or bust. They're just gonna, they're just gonna add expenses and you need constant diligence yep. to keep that from happening. You know, so the, the perception is still out there that, you know, it's sort of an irresponsible on accountable organization. So, but we're, we're working on changing that. So, okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this was the, uh, remember I said we're gonna, f the management team's gonna focus for the first time. So this is what I did at the beginning of the budget process the prior year is I said, okay, look, we, we, need, we need something to guide the budget. Because right now it's just everybody's just doing everything. We can't. So let's try to get this down to a small list. So this is the list that the management team came up with a little over a year ago. So these are the top 10 things we're gonna do. Okay, which was good. Okay. Uh, we're going through a new strategic planning process now. I'll try to share some of that information with you. Um, and then um, this is where I was gonna talk about the new budget process. So this is where we're coming in this year. And this is where we wanna go next year. So you can see we do have uh, some improvement built into it. And um, uh, this is, um, the reason I put this in here is uh, plans, plans don't always work out. <coughs> and you need to adjust, you have to be able to, you know, so we had to have a kind of a risk mitigation strategy. And so we said, well, you know, if, if the revenue doesn't get here, then what are we gonna do? And really the plan was, okay, we still, we can still come back and do a, uh, uh, <coughs> you know, some type of a significant labor reduction and layoffs. We didn't have to do that, but that was actually on the table for the entire last year. Um, and one of the things we've been able to show them is this trend right here, okay? So uh, I don't have FTEs on here, but FTEs are actually down. They've actually been tracking down all year, even, even when volume's been coming up. Uh, and so the results, uh, this is for six months. Uh, this would be like uh, July through December of you know this fiscal year versus last fiscal year so we had a 7.6 percent uh, increase in revenue supported by cash this time and expenses went up 2.8 percent a year for, for that year prior year they had gone up 10 percent so we largely reversed the expense growth trend and started to bring it back down so the profitability jumped from here to here um, at the time we had 2.7, we're up to about a 4% EBITDA margin right now. And um, here's where you can see that the prior year we had 3,965 FTEs. At this point we had 3,896. I think right now it's like 3,900. Okay, so pretty good. So, but that's not a layoff, right? So that's good. Uh, and here's the latest summary. Uh, we said this is as of April, or for the month of March and April, nine months, <coughs> profitable, pretty good even a margin, cash collections have been great, blah, blah, blah. Uh, permanent agreement, no longer have an interim agreement with the county, we now have a permanent agreement with the county because they came back and said, we like your plan. So it's, it goes out through 2034, so it's a 20 year agreement and we're in compliance. And we've got this budget process going. Okay, oh, here's the, uh, here's the FTE trend. So you can see, this is where it was in July. See, it, even then it was running up, and then we've been working it back down. See there? Okay, and here's the revenue trend. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. Okay, this is the last slide I have. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, I love this quote. I found it to be true. <laughs> okay. Questions? Yeah. I saw in the slide there was something about like something just Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we're looking for, um, is that there? No. Da, 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 da. There. Okay. So um, 
This is kind of under the heading of um, assessing long-term opportunities. Uh, so, you know, one of the things I've been doing is sort of digging in and, you know, what is the, uh, you know, what are the opportunities? So one thing is we have really high benefit costs. And the question is, well, why is that? And uh, a, a large number of our employees are still in the um, SARA, which is the County Pension Program, Alameda County Employee Retirement Association, uh, <coughs> along with the, the police, the county employees, uh, judges, things like that. Okay. And the way that works is um, it's, it's one big plan, and, you know, there's a certain cost. You have to be an actuary to go through it, but it's a big cost. And then they allocate those costs out. So the amount that we're allocated every year is about $15 million, okay? Uh, and that's up from, you know, probably $20 million when it started, so it's grown, okay? Well, one of the things we've realized is that <coughs> the sort of the, the composition and the nature of the employee, our employees versus everybody else, is different. And really, a lot of the cost is being driven not by our employees, but by the county employees, okay? But they've never changed the allocation methodology to reflect that. So they're essentially over-allocating those costs to us, making us pay for them, okay? So our point is, well, wait a minute, that's not right. You know, we should, you know, we're happy to pay our fair share, but really somebody else should be paying for that. And the amounts are like probably eight to $10 million a year. So it's significant, it's worth doing. So what we're doing is putting together our own um, argument uh, that we'll make to the board of ACERA saying, you know, uh, we, wanna, we wanna get charged less. And so from ACERA's standpoint, that they said, okay, fine, but that means we have to allocate to somebody else. Well, who, who do you think that is? The county treasurer, the same guy that lends us the money. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, Steve, dude, you know. So, you know, but the point is, um, you know, eight to 10 million a year is, is, you know, we're under a lot of pressure to perform, adjust expenses, get them appropriate. So we're saying, okay, we're looking at everything. This one is inappropriate. So we should be paying less and, and going forward. And also we want to recapture what we've overpaid going backwards. Mm -hmm. So if we did that and it's about $50 million, <coughs> uh, we wouldn't actually get that in cash. Well, because where does all our cash go? To the county, yeah. So what would happen is we would get a credit against that loan and it would drop from 110 down to 60. Ooh, that would be really exciting. Uh, this other one I think I talked about, which is the capital cost reimbursement. I think I talked about that last time about getting capital costs. And that's, that's worth probably 10 to 15 million a year. But, okay. Other questions? Okay, have the class has been good so far? Okay. Is there, are there any other subjects? We're probably going to do dive into revenue next time, and uh, probably finish with uh, strategic planning. Um, I kind of I kind of do this up on Saturday and Sunday while I'm watching TV. So, uh, but if there's any other subjects you want to hear about, I'm happy to happy to do it. Okay. Yes. Okay, I can do that because I need to. I need to write that up anyway. So, okay. I mean, it sounds interesting and, and a nice switch from how we've been doing it. Yeah. Which is yeah. Painful. It is. It's painful <laughs> for. <laughs> it's painful for everybody. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's, it's just like well, and we're, we've been just like, you know, then I then I say no, <laughs> you know, it's just like you know. No, I mean really, you do all this work and then I get it and it says okay, the, the organization wants to spend a hundred million more and I said, well, you know, I'm sorry, we can't do that, but we've got to have a better process. It's got to be more. Yeah. But I like that, the way that sounds though, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like this ongoing yeah. process, the benchmark that they have. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. It, it makes me think of X and the Y. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard it maybe in some since I've been here that X and the Y is maybe kind of here, but I'm still <laughs> unclear on whether it's here or are we going to re-implement it. So typically they come and ask me a lot of questions. We talk about some of my yeah. examples. Yeah. 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 Um, it's here. Uh, I'm not going to say it's perfect, but I think it's the dialogue that's most important about it. That we start. We have something. We start here and, and just you know, you know, what make it happen. 
Is it? Okay. Ray, Ray, okay, Ray. Okay. It's, just, it's, just, it's a little lacking. So yeah, it's easy to I've get been pulling out actual yeah, ideas yeah, lately yeah, yeah. for you to be perfectly honest. I, I don't think I've pulled it out the last like two quarters. Right. You can't get reports. You, can't, you have no idea who your care group is. And, and trying to tease that information out yeah. is it's yeah. difficult. It's and difficult, yeah. It seems very um, uh, almost secret. And I, yeah. I don't know why. We should be really transparent about who our care groups are. Sure, what yeah. What kind yeah. of benchmarks we're aiming for. But it's yeah. just not. There's a lot of room for opportunity to use that in a yeah. model. Yeah, okay, I, good. I know in respiratory care, there are only a certain, there's probably eight pages, nine pages worth of data that they want you to submit. But of those, the ones that are asterisks, we have to, yeah. and everyone likes forms. So uh, how robust is that going to be if, if the minimum default is four? You know, is it worth our time? Is it going to give us back? I mean, you can go through all the calculations and get the numbers. It's very time consuming. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're using it just because it, we have to have something and it's here. It doesn't mean that we're going to be strictly driven by those numbers, but we, we do want to have a dialogue about, you know, whatever, how everybody's staffing and why. And, um, you know, so. um, speaking of physician groups, yes. um, I was recently talking to a physician and I was going to give a report and everyone I talked to said, oh, just ignore this not a report. I'd love to know how soon I can look at it. Okay. okay. Terrific. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a good uh, have a good day. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh good, okay. Good, thanks. Okay.